what I wanted to do was kind of continue along from what we talked about before, which is obviously central nervous system and all that. Great. And you've obviously done uh, some talks and presented on the brain. And then you're doing stuff like I'll see you training and people will see you training and it looks like you're beating the hell out of yourself. So on the one hand, you have you just kind of working, loading yourself. And then there's other things that you're doing that, that we talk about where you're very precise. And so I want to try to wrap my head around how do these two things meet in the middle for you? And what are you doing with your clients? What are you doing on the education side? What are you doing with yourself? And what kind of answers are you putting together here? Because this all really fascinates me. Even from that talk we did at Drive where you're talking about, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm probably Mm. doing something better than most people. Like, I like that theme. You know, obviously there's some humility there, but at the same time, Uh, It encourages me because you're kind of pushing the boundaries and exploring new areas and challenging yourself, which I think is pretty cool. And I don't think a lot of people are like, oh, this is my philosophy. This is what I'm going to do, you know, until they they reach the grave and and they may even (laughs) try and rationalize and justify it. You know, like this. Okay, I'm this guy. I'm going to be high, low. I'm going to be this. I mean, like, and it's so boring. (laughs) It's so freaking boring, right? So, you know, when somebody's like really pushing the boundaries and going, "Fuck, I don't know." Like, let's just try this and let's see what happens. And you know, maybe something good comes out of it. Maybe you know, maybe we get some some great little Instagram videos. I don't know, but I, I just think it's much more exciting, especially nowadays when everybody's trying to come up with the answer and it's like, well, fuck, we don't have the answer. We're going to just, you know, try to find a whole bunch of answers and, and, and try all this stuff. And, 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 and the great thing is you have probably a much more well-rounded science background than most of these other people. But, you know, at the same time, you're, you're a little reckless with it, which I, which I love. So, yeah. Well, so this we, is good. This is good stuff. I feel like this should be the podcast. We got to hit that re- <laughs> that record button. Um, I know Pat. The last time we met, I was talking about you know some. I had some issues with my hip and my back and. And I know you were doing some pretty precise things with me, but at the same time, I know that when I would train, I had no problems. So when I pushed myself, when I would sprint or lift something heavy, I don't think I would ever have any issues, but it was more the downtime, the low times, walking around when I'd have problems. And when I watch you train, same sort of thing. You're pushing yourself. It's You're redlining, and, and I know in our discussions about the brain and, and, and neurotransmitters we talked about before, uh, you're really big on trying to elicit certain responses with your training. And when you're doing your talks and you're talking about the brain, it's not as simple as, you know, oh, we just got to tap into the brain or, you know, use some sort of loose language around it. You're very precise about what you're trying to elicit, even though it might look like hammering people. Could you Could yeah. you explain more about that? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. And, um, you know, this this is an area where I just, when I'm thinking about the brain, I, I try to think, like, what, what uses it might have, you know, like, what is the purpose of having this thing? And, um, and pretty much everything, it, it goes back to survival-based uh, mechanisms. Like, a brain has to give me some advantage over an animal that doesn't have a brain uh, in my ability to survive and reproduce on this planet. And, you know, you kind of go back into the history of how these things developed. And, and you could say that probably the, the first creature that would have like a proper brain would be a, um, a reptile of some sort. And we have these modern day reptiles existing around us to be able to, to know the extent of like what a primitive reptile's brain would have also been capable of doing. So, um, you know, the primitive reptile kind of brain has, has a lot of these hind brain structures. And the ones that I usually talk about are going to be the basal ganglia and the cerebellum and, um, and to a certain degree, kind of like a, a hippocampus. Um, but with a reptile, I usually just think of things like a basal ganglia and a cerebellum. And that reptile uses that brain to be able to just simply drive behaviors. 
you know, there's like a stimulus and that stimulus triggers the, uh, the, those parts of the brain to be able to identify that, that this event is happening and a behavior is, is elicited. And, and, and really reptiles lack like a, a proper cortex. They have kind of the beginnings of something along those lines. And, uh, but it's, they're, they're really unable to like predict, uh, outcomes to a, to the way that other the mammals can, you know, like, uh, like a rat, for instance, is able to go into a maze and it can learn that maze and it can get faster at going through that maze and finding the cheese versus like, if I just kept putting a lizard in the same maze, it would just continue to do the same behaviors, the same exploratory behaviors. Like it would rear, it would sniff, it would scratch, it would do all these things that an animal would do if it was looking for something. Uh, particularly if it can smell and sense that there's food for it. Whereas a rat can remember that, oh, I've, I've been here before. I know that if I turn right here and I go down this hallway and take my third left, that I'll be able to find that cheese. So a lizard, it's like their first time every time in the same maze. A rat can, can memorize a maze. But a human being is different than both of those things not only because we have a more high-powered memory that's able to make predictions to a greater degree, but we also have uh, a situation where our cortex has usurped some of the more primitive equipment. And like, if I look at, at what causes the, the muscles of a rat to move, it would be the basal ganglia in large part sending wires down to the spine, and then those wires from the spine would go out to the muscles and command the muscles versus a human being uses the cortex. Uh, the cortex sends wires down to the hindbrain, and then the hindbrain sends wires down to the spine, and then the spine sends muscles out to the body. So I'm able to use my thinking brain, my, my memory and prediction brain, to actually command my muscles. So that's why if I kept putting a, a rat into a maze, it wouldn't like if I put humans into a giant maze, they might eventually use their muscles to do things like build hang gliders to be able to, to go over the walls, whereas rats aren't making little airplanes to be able to get to the cheese faster. They act, a rat will still use all of the same primitive behaviors that a reptile will use driven by a reptile's brain. A rat simply has a memory prediction motor or, or, or a system put on top of an old school behavioral driving reptilian brain. It, it, it can't do any new different behaviors compared to a reptile, whereas the human can simply because of the cortex's usurpation of the, the wiring for the motor system from a basal ganglia. So we're, we're, we're a different kind of animal. Like I don't think – like other animals don't classify or they, – they don't rank how well they did their movements. You know what I mean? Like lions aren't sitting around being like, hey, did you see the way that, that Jimmy took down that gazelle today? That was unbelievable. But we're like, man, did you see that dunk that Russell Westbrook threw down last night? That was vicious. Like uh, I can't even believe that. Because we attach more like emotion or cognitive definitions on our movement than other animals do because the cortex kind of has gotten all messed up with our movement system compared to other animals. It gives us this ability to be more creative and do more different kinds of movements than any other animal. But we've also developed emotional attachments to mo movement as well as like these, uh, these sort of cognitive uh, biases towards towards certain things. Uh, so I think it's our greatest gift, but it's also kind of a problem. And um, Especially when we get injured, wouldn't you say? Like, there's that emotional, oh, yeah. predictive attachment to injury now. It's, it is huge. It is absolutely enormous. And as soon as you start sensing something that you remember as being problematic, you're putting yourself into an, a pattern. And, and you're just going ahead and, and you're, you're probably, and that pattern is like a cognitive pattern, an emotional pattern, a motor pattern, a sensory pattern, a conscious uh, pattern and an unconscious pattern. So it's all wrapped up like that. Those are all the functions that a brain does. 
but it's it's hard to escape that. Uh, and so it's it's kind of like I anytime I get somebody that's that's hurting or having problems, I, I need you to feel something new and different, um, something that you have not been feeling. And and again, like where, where we've talked before is kind of like uh, this serotonin dominant brain is the feeling side of the brain. It's, it's, the, it's the much more dominant one from a sensory perspective. I, I need you to be right here with me right now. I need you to notice the way that you're breathing while you're doing this activity. I need you to learn your body. I need you to learn that if your hip moves in this direction, that that's an adductor that's responsible muscularly for causing that movement. Um, I need you to feel the way that while you're holding that adductor, and you're exhaling, how that impacts a rib cage in that positioning and what that does muscularly to your system. And, and as soon as you're able to feel new things and learn new things about your body, I think I'm tapping into that part of your brain that I, I look at as just like your, your heavy sensory system versus training. I don't want you to be all that sensory. I want you to be just going for it, like not feeling much of anything, uh, chasing those external cues and drivers and distances and numbers, uh, not being very thoughtful or cognizant at all, like just being very much animalistic about things. And and maybe that's why um, a lot of the time when you just get into a group mentality and you have guys around you and you're kind of pushing each other and there's a lot of yelling and screaming um, and, and the training isn't that scientific or whatever you want to call it or, or structured, maybe they can still get good results based on, on, on that, you know, group mentality and, 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 and almost hysteria around it. And, and they're not thinking, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we talked about hunting before Yeah. and, and that's, I, I look at a lot of it as, as just going back to those kinds of concepts of like, you know, you're probably always going to see performance increase in those environments when you have other people pushing you and you've kind of got this, this communal physical effort taking place. Uh, you can't let those people down, like the whole tribe's ability to survive probably depends on that. Um, and, and really like you can, you can say, I'm, I'm so curious about, uh, you know, human evolution and, and going back and studying our, our ancestors and what differentiated homo sapien, even from Neanderthal and other archaic human species. And it does seem to be that cultural thing that we've got going on for each other with, with our, our own, with our species where you know, we, we share information. And as soon as that information is shared and people know about it, like, uh, things change dramatically, more dramatically than, than any other component. Like, uh, I, I look at even like within the strength world, cause that's still kind of primarily where, where I live. Uh, you get all these Instagram videos of people that do these ridiculously impressive things. And it's almost like, man, I didn't even think that was humanly possible. But now I saw that guy do that. And now, well, I want to do that. I think I can beat that guy. He's not like, he doesn't impress me that much. Um, but you start, like the numbers are going crazy. Like in Strongman, um, you know, you get guys just posting their workouts on a daily basis. And you see someone do something that, you know, if, if you took some of the guys now and put them into early 2000s Strongman, I mean, it wouldn't even be a contest. Like they would blow those guys away so badly, it would be a joke. So you're just seeing these these feats of of physical performance that that nobody thought possible, but nobody was watching guys in and day in and day out back then. So it might be different with sprinting because it's kind of on display. Like yeah. when it comes to the Olympics and who can run faster than anyone else in the world. Like, hey, we're going to put these guys right against each other and we're going to see it. But in, in other worlds, like in, in other realms of fitness demonstration, like you don't get to see it as, as frequently. Um, so we're starting people are around the world. More people are getting exposed to these things. And you're starting to see people do things that you thought were impossible years ago. But is it like the four minute mile Roger Bannister, like he broke the four minute mile and then the floodgates open? 
that's exactly what it is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like the, the thousand pound deadlift used to be like, you know, that's impossible or it's, it's, and now you just have people doing that left and right. You know, what's going on in the brain in your opinion? What, what, what is, what are the factors that are allowing this to happen? So I, I just look at, 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 um, at the training brain as being the dopamine brain. And we started talking about hunting and, and dopamine is, is such a powerful neurotransmitter when it comes to allowing uh, a predatory species to hunt. But, but particularly the way that, that Homo sapiens hunted, which was persistence hunting strategies. Uh, <clears throat> so if you read books on dopamine, you'll see that it's associated with certain things. Like it's associated with delayed gratification. If you want the, if you want the biggest dopamine surge you can possibly get, delayed gratification is the ultimate ticket. You know, we, we talk about like Facebook is this instantaneous gratification, constant dopamine drip. And that's true. Like you're going to get a little bit of dopamine, but it's not even close to the kind of feeling of reward that you would have on the day that you graduate college Mm -hmm. or, you know, after you've been or going to the Olympics, you know what I mean? Like sacrificing four years of your life for this one really abstract goal because dopamine it's associated with delayed gratification it's associated with abstraction the ability to use your imagination to picture things that are not directly within your reach at this moment in time uh so if you think about hunters a hunter they don't they can't reach out and touch that animal right now otherwise they'd they'd have it killed they are going to primitive humans are going to be going up against animals that are much faster than them, much more athletic than them. So the strategy that we came up with was that we're going to chase these large athletic quadrupeds in the midday of the African heat. And if I make a quadruped gallop, it will overheat in that condition. It doesn't have the same heat dissipation mechanisms that that I do, but it's probably going to take a few hours to get to that point. So I'm going to start chasing it. It's going to gallop away at a rate that's much faster than what any of us can run at. But hopefully one of us is clever enough to know how to track it and be able to analyze the broken branches and and other debris and, and see the direction of hoof prints and things of that nature. But you have to use a very advanced thinking brain to be able to pull that feed off. Um, You have to use deductive reasoning ultimately to accomplish that task. And you, you know, to, so we have to deal with heat. We have to delay our gratification. We have to persist. And it's, it's kind of like, you're going to be incredibly uncomfortable, uh, but you have to continue on. You have to, to chase this prize. Um, so, so I, I look at it the same way with, with training in many ways, it's the big hunt. Like, it's just a a different chase in many ways. Like, uh, you have to train for this thing that's way out in the future. Like, no other animal could imagine doing these things today because I want to be faster or bigger and stronger for three months from now. You know, uh, like, cheetahs don't have preseason training uh, so that they're better at catching gazelles. Uh, we're the only animal that does, does things like that. Do you set training up then knowing that you have to have this delayed gratification, uh, process where you're going, okay, we're going to have a competition. We're going to have a test. We're going to have something in the distance that they're keeping their eye on as part of this whole process and understanding that what I'm doing today is going to work towards me getting that gratification later on. I think it's 100% a critical component of of setting up a good training plan. I I think good storytelling fits into it too, to tell you the truth. Like uh, when when the other, some of the other, I think dopamine is just unbelievably fascinating. It goes in a million directions. But um, religion is a highly dopaminergic concept. Uh, The fact that you are going through your whole life and behaving in a specific way so that after you're dead, you can go someplace else that's better. Uh, it's the ultimate delayed gratification thing. 
that we've been using for thousands of years to regulate people's behaviors in many ways. So uh, you can significantly alter behavioral characteristics if someone believes that the prize that's out there is big enough. Um, so it's kind of like I need to create this allure for you. And, and maybe I, I give you history lessons in, in how important this is. And I tell you about like the, the past heroes that have done these remarkable things and, and they've sacrificed so much to attain this level of like being almost immortal. Uh, and, and I think that those are the things that, that really motivate human beings to do the impossible. Well, think about so, Christmas too. Like my kids are like, Hey, there's yeah. 10 more days to Christmas. There's, you know, five more days to Christmas. And that, that's a dopamine, you know, uh, it's huge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, Christmas is actually a perfect example. But yeah. I mean, I, I know a lot of parents that like, even in the summer, they're like, Hey, would Santa approve of what you're doing right now? And, and you can significantly alter behavior. Like ultimately, uh, we're, I, I started kind of talking about like a brain's purpose is, is survival. And the biggest thing that you can do to change your survival potential is, is behavior. Uh, and, and for driving someone towards fitness, the biggest part of the game is behavior modification. It really is when you, when you get down to it. But why would I change my behavior? Like I need to sell you a big story mm -hmm. so that you want that more than anything you could possibly imagine. Yeah, and, and, and to some degree, your religion analogy, it, it kind of integrates with what people are doing with exercise and training because they almost treat it like a religion, like I'm doing this and this is the way I train and, and don't you even question it, you know, to some yeah. degree. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were talking, we had talked about, you know, the dopamine issue, and I have done you know, sensory deprivation float tanks. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, I'm supposed to calm down, but sometimes I'll get out of those things thinking, whoa, I'm amped up. What's going on there? Yeah. Um, again, like <clears throat> sensory, like I, I, I look at, at the brain as, as two sides of the same coin. And on one side of the coin, I've got this, this dopamine system. <clears throat> and on the other side of the coin, I have this serotonin norepinephrine system. And the more that I remove sensory information going to your brain, the more I'm going to allow the dopamine system to amplify itself and become more and more pronounced. And a sensory deprivation tank, you, if you look at the literature on, on the, the neurotransmitter responses to that, almost nothing will increase dopamine levels more than a sensory deprivation tank, which makes perfect sense because it's literally depriving you of your sensory information. And uh, very similar to sleep, sleep and dopamine are highly tied together. When people aren't getting enough sleep, their, their dopamine levels go in the toilet and they, they experience anhedonia and depression and there's no motivation to do anything. And part of that is that while you're asleep, you're you're cutting off all the sensory information going back to your brain and your, your brain is sort of cutting off the motor responses as well so that you don't act out your dreams. But, uh, it, it's creating a situation where a dope, like, a, like dopamine is also associated in a lot of ways with psychosis and, um, and dreaming in many ways is very insane. You know, like you're, you're imagining, these things taking place, there's nothing happening, but your, your brain is creating these vivid pictures of imaginary worlds with strange colors and noises and plots and, and, and you can fly and all this sort of stuff, but it's, it's an unconstrained dopamine brain that has no sensory information going to it. And it's, it's absolutely critical for regulating, uh, your, your neurotransmitter levels. Uh, and, and probably one of the reasons why you know, if, if, if you're not getting consistent, solid sleep with athletes, there's very few things that will have them tank faster than that. They're not going to, they're going to be flat. They're not going to be motivated. They're going to have no bounce to them. Uh, if that's the case. And it's largely that dopamine driver. Um, if, if you've got good dopamine levels, you're going to be excited. You're going to want to go get it. Uh, you're ready to hunt and, and, and chase. Now, 
you know, some of the friends, we, we mutual friends we have in, in New York City, I'll talk to them about some of the stuff you're doing. And, and I want to get into this area of rehabilitation and dealing with pain or injury uh, that you have experience with. Because some of these guys are like, I'd rather just send these guys to Pat sometimes because I know he's got a method that's going to work rather than sending them to like a conventional physical therapist. Do you think that, like I know from my own experience, the physical therapy can be rather arbitrary. Like you'll send somebody and they're like, oh, I got a good result. You send another person, I got no result. What's yeah. going on there? Like what? That's a great question, man. Like, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a perfect track record. If anybody says they do, I think they're full of shit. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's kind of like, I get, especially in New York, like I'll get sent people and it's, they just can't feel anything. They've, they've like blocked out the world uh, in large part because the world in New York is fairly assaulting. You know, it's, it's like you go down the street and the ground is shaking underneath your feet. Uh, there's fire trucks blaring, there's lights coming all in all around you. It's just overwhelming. So they just shut down their whole sensory world and they probably work in a job that's so abstract. And, um, you know, it's like if they're sitting at a computer all day, like, uh, Dopamine and focal vision are highly tied together too. Like you, if you're going to hunt, you got to focus on something. You have to narrow your visual field and, uh, and, and just go forward in many ways. There's no peripheral kinds of movement with that. Uh, so, so I just have these people that, that they don't want to feel their world. They don't want to be present. They want to stare at their screen. They want to be on their phone. They want to be removed from the here and now completely because there's, there's nothing that great about the here and now. Yeah. So to try to get these people to come in and like feel the way that their body works and to feel the way that like air movement and biasing air into different compartments of a lung changes their, the positions of their body. They can't feel anything. And, um, it's kind of like, you know, those people, I just have them do intense exercise that doesn't hurt them. And they like that. I just, I'm like, well, I can't, they can't play with the serotonin nor norepinephrine side of their brain. It's like broken on this person. I'm just going to send them in the other direction in a way that's probably going to improve aerobic fitness and, and, and work some other elements that I think are pretty consistent for helping people feel better. Um, but I don't get this easy, low hanging fruit, sensory, nor epi serotonin, present conscious feeling brain. Um, to be able to come online. But you've had success, obviously, with, with, with some of these people by pushing them in the other direction. Yeah, it's, it's just sort of like I try to make these determinations quickly. I feel like New York is a place where you don't have much time or leeway to screw up. If, if you screw up once with some people, they're done with you. And if it's taking longer than what they anticipate it should take, they're like done with you. So I, I, I like that because I have to get really good at my craft to deal with these people. And I have to read the defense very quickly and, and figure out what kind of person I've got in front of me. Like, and it's usually pretty easy. You just have to be attentive and, and, and like look at these people. But, you know, I, I don't think I do techniques or exercises that are all that different than what other people are doing. I think I just try to coach them differently because I, I think that if you're, if you're going into rehabilitation exercise with the same thought process of training related exercise, I think you're, you're, you're going in the wrong direction for the, the brain that you're going after. Like, I don't, I, I tend not to tell people what they should be feeling. I ask people what they're feeling. I, I, it's always question based. I'm trying to, <clears throat> almost aggravate them a little bit so that they become more there. I want them searching for what's actually going on in their body, whether it like, you know, I think like good training coaching is usually like external cue related. Yep. And I think good rehabilitation coaching is not telling you what internal cues I want you to feel, but asking you how you perceive the internal status of your body and how your body is actually like working as a, as a unit. Like, and then 
trying to like, I, I found that I never have any success with someone until the following experience happens. Like, uh, I'll do something with them and, and they won't, the, it'll be something that they notice about their body. It's usually something I need to have this person notice that their left side of their body is different than the right side of their body. They're doing two different things with the two sides. Mm -hmm. And then they go, Oh, that's interesting. Why do you think that's happening? Or, you know what I mean? Like as soon as they say that, I'm like, Oh, this person's now interested in this. They actually have some level of buy-in. And, and usually I'll try to flip it on them. I'll, I'll say, well, I don't know. What do you think? And, and because it's like, I, I really fully believe that everyone is looking for an opportunity to tell you about themselves. Sure. I think that's what everybody wants more than anything in the whole world. So it's like, Hey, we just noticed this thing about you. That's, that's different. Like, it's like, wow, it's this eye opening light bulb moment for you. But do you really want me to tell you about you? I don't think so. I think you want to tell me about you. And I'm going to give you your shot to, to do that. And then so I have the person tell me about them and whatever it is that their their rationale is for for why their body is doing what it's doing. And and then it's then I'll go into the back and forth. I'll be like, that's that's a super interesting explanation. I mean, it's it's always wrong. It's always like comically wrong. But then I'll I'll I'll, I'll do something with them that like, I'm pretty sure I know the mechanics of what's going on with their body and I'll put them into the right position and get the right mechanics happening. And I'll say, well, well, how does that feel? And they're like, well, that's different. That, and, and it's like, well, well, let's, let's have you stand up. How do you feel now? And, and usually they'll say something like, well, that thing doesn't hurt anymore. And I'll say, well, what do you make of that? And now it's on them again. And they're, again, they're kind of interested in the process but I need to do everything I possibly can because most of the time these people come in and they just want to be removed from the situation that they're in. Sure. You know, pain, pain does that to people. So they're, I know they're not present with me and it's kind of like, I need to draw you in. I need to, I need to like throw my lure out there and hook you in. And, and it's, it sounds almost like crap pseudoscience, sort of like the TB 12 method sort of deal. But I, I think it's it's just a different realm of science that people don't get into. It's just it's literally a brain, and 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 brains are super interested in figuring out their own organism, and most like as as soon as I can create an environment where this person is interested in their own body, bang, like they're with me. I can see it in their yeah. eyes. They're they're no longer thinking about what they have to get to. They're totally caught up in this experience. And, and now I think I can do something with them. What is your take on this whole, you know, push? And even in professional sports, I see this because obviously the schedules are difficult. And, and if you're an NFL player, you're getting beat up every weekend and practice is tough and meeting. What is your take on recovery and what would be your approach? Because I've seen examples where recovery is very like, okay, let's, you know, do something really easy and stretch, massage, go in a hot tub or cold, you know, I, I've seen better results by actually doing stuff, like actually getting yeah. up to do stuff. I don't know. What, what is your take on recovery these days? I mean, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I think it depends on your age for the athlete. Like, I think that when you're talking about younger athletes, it's like um, when like inflammation drives a lot of really good adaptations in a body. And, um, and I'm looking for those younger athletes to make those kinds of adaptations. And, and with the older athletes, it seems as though if I can reduce inflammation, I, I'll oftentimes see good performance. And I mean, I just notice it in myself. Like there's very few days where things don't ache. And, um, and if I can just do certain things that, that reduce that, that level of aching in those typical spots, I perform way better. And, and I, I know that for me, like some hydrotherapy just does wonders and probably because I can feel my body, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I can feel, uh, my hips and my knees and my ankles. It's, it's just much easier for me to, to feel things with that, that surrounding, uh, water touching me. So I do think that there's a level of, of difference where, where with your younger athletes, more active things might be 
really good, like just promoting a little bit of that acute inflammation for kind of like a hormetic response that, that can just cause the body to kick all of its repair mechanisms on. Whereas with the older athlete, it, it might be a little bit more where you need some more external things and some more passive things to, to give them a break. But, um, you know, where, where I tend to go back to is like, I, I don't like to make guesswork things on things. And, and really like the, the presentation I did down in Texas this past weekend was my version of like trying to give a model for, for biomechanics for, for people to, to hold on to and grasp. Mm -hmm. So I, I based it on the fact that there's three cardinal planes that you can move through. And, and I also look at it as though there's three primary athletic stances or that, that people present themselves in. And I look at those, those stances as being bilateral symmetrical, mm -hmm. uh, the feet next to each other, yep. uh, as, asymmetrical staggered front back, which you could think of as a, from an exercise perspective as a, anything like a lunge forward. Uh, and then asymmetrically lateral staggered, which if you're thinking from an exercise standpoint, like a lateral lunge, but then within those stances, I want to show competency in the three planes. And, and I just tried to do my best to create like a checklist that people can follow to determine if the person that they're working with is able to demonstrate, you know, sagittal plane competencies in uh, asymmetrical front back staggered stance. And like, you know, how would I know those things? And so the, I, I divide those competencies into sensory competencies and motor competencies. You know, I, I want to see from a sagittal plane perspective that the, the middle of the skull is positioned over the middle of the pelvic floor. And from a motor competency or from a sensory competency standpoint, the big sagittal plane muscles that I really care about are hamstrings and abdominals. Mm -hmm. um, I want I want to see that your body looks like it's lined up the way that it should be lined up in this position, and that you're finding and feeling the right muscles to support this position that you're in. Um, so I, I just tried to break down, you know, every every element I could from like uh, warm up to. Uh, light, fast activities that I would categorize as like med balls, jumping, speed and agility, acceleration, top speed based drills, um, heavy ballistic act activities such as like, think of it like a weight lifting, like Olympic style lifting, mm -hmm. heavy, slow activities, uh, moderate load, moderate velocity assistance work, and then uh, conditioning type things. I tried to categorize all of those fitness realms and explain what examples of drills belong in each stance and each plane. So it's kind of like, well, what's like a frontal plane asymmetrically positioned stance, front back, uh, energy system conditioning drill, uh, a versa climber would be, would be an example of that, mm -hmm. you know? So it just kind of like, I, I look at it like, what does this particular athlete lack? Because I just I think that that training and making progress is as much about just like, OK, I can see what you can do, but I need to know what you can't do. I'm making my to not do list or, or like your crap list. And if I can just improve your crap list and, and bring you up to a competency level that I think is appropriate, then I'm very confident that you're going to move well, feel good and perform at a high level. Um, but again, it's like a, every model is oversimplified and probably wrong and, and needs to be tweaked based on individuals and, and specifics and all that kind of stuff. What's your, what's your take on people perceiving that there's risk involved in what they're doing when they're training? Like a lot of, I know in a lot of professional team settings, everybody wants to be safe. Um, you know, for liability reasons, you know, their job security and all that. Is it imperative that you have some perception of risk when you train and prepare yourself, in your opinion? I, I think that an element of that is, is important, actually, because um, it at least makes sure that that person is with me in the training session. They're paying attention. They're doing yep. something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know if a, an organism will adapt 
if it's not threatened on some level. Yes. You know, so it's it's kind of like I I sort of need to threaten you if we're going to do anything. Otherwise, I'm sort of just babysitting you. Like we're killing time. Like, are we training? And it's okay. Like, if if we want to just be like, listen, like this guy is a world class athlete. I can't possibly make him more athletic in the sport that he plays. Like, just let him stand on the the wobble disc. He likes it. It makes him feel like he's doing something, and it's like a part of his ritual. It's like if that's what we're saying and we're open and honest and admitting that, that's fine. But if someone's telling me that like. I'm trying to improve the physiology of this individual and, and actually cause adaptations to happen. I, I have to threaten you on some level. Like why would an organism make any change unless there was stress and, and possible negative consequences to, to that particular environment? Like there's, there's no driver. Like even if you study evolution, like uh, animals don't evolve during good times they evolve when the environment is threatening them at a very high level. That's when you see uh, a large degree of, of mutation take place in that species. So it's, it's tricky because it's like you start talking like uh, Lamarck, the, the evolutionist who has been discredited with Darwinianism taking over and saying that giraffes have long necks because they just tried to stretch them so much to get to, up to the fruit. But, you know... Um, it's still like, you know, the microcosm oftentimes does have an element of the macrocosm living inside of it. Yeah, no, it's I, I find it really interesting. And and I would obviously I would even argue that through the course of their season and playing in games like, say, we talk basketball, ice hockey, baseball, where they have a lot of games. I think there's so many competitions that they almost don't feel like there's any risk, even within the competition. They're so they've habituated so much. So I, maybe you have to do something different in training to, to move them forward. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, you know, there's an element of like, uh, you know, in, in many ways, dopamine is a habituation based chemical. You know, it's like it, 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 when you study habit formation stuff, you better be ready to study dopamine. Um, you know, you're, you, you do certain behaviors, you get a reward for doing them. And it gets patterned. You're more likely to continue to do that behavior. Uh, but there has to be a reward associated with you doing a certain behavior. So as soon as the word reward comes into, the, into play, it's 100% you're talking about dopamine again. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, to just neuroplastically kind of remodel your, your system to continue to do the same habitual behaviors if you felt like there was a reward there. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, uh, and, and then the next time you, if you keep doing those things, you get to the point where it's like, you, you aren't conscious of it anymore, you know, and, and you are just going through the motions and it's very efficient and streamlined and all that kind of stuff. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a terrible place to be, but sometimes it, if it, it's good until it's not good, if that makes sense. Like, Keep running unconscious as long as you can until there's a problem. But when there's a problem, I'm going to all of a sudden need to make you aware of why that problem is happening. It's like with athletes as they age. Like, I don't want to mess with you with any of anything until there's a problem. I just want to let your, your genetics just, just run wild and have fun and express itself. But at a certain point in every athlete's career, they're going to start having some like chronic pain problems. And now I kind of need to make you cognizant and co like consciously aware of components of your body. And I might actually hurt performance in the short term by doing that. Like, you know, the best way to screw with a golfer's swing is to t ask them like, hey, what do you think you're doing with your elbow during your backswing? And now they're focused on that. And it's going to be like, you're going to shank it all over the place. But you know, when you've identified to me, like, listen, I can't do the thing that I like to do because I'm having pain in, in response to it. It's kind of like, all right, well, we're going to have to open door number two and, and kind of go down this road. And eventually I want to be able to close this door and have you not think about this stuff. But for a period of time, we have to solve this problem. 
And, and I, I think that sometimes that can be the case in skill-based sports as well. Like a baseball swing is a great example. Like you don't want to be thinking when you're up there. That's like the worst thing you could possibly do. And, but everybody's going to go into a slump. And then at some point, they're probably going to have to analyze film. They're probably going to have to work with a coach who's going to actually break down their, their technique. And, and it's, it's a process. It's just make sure you're not going into that process too soon. Like, don't screw up a good thing if it's working. <laughs> Do you think some of these technical errors, whether it's the golf swing or the slump in hitting, you know, is it a technical error? Is it something that is wrong with their technique or is it something more general? Is it like, is it something, a neurotransmitter related thing? Is it sleep related? Is it, um, you know, fatigue related? And that maybe mm. by chasing the technical errors that you're actually missing the boat. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I'm not going to pretend like I for sure have the, the right answer to something like that. I would say that motor control, like fatigue, when fatigue enters the picture, the first thing that's going to happen is like a, a new response in terms of afferent information going back to the brain. And then your brain will be processing new information slightly different and you'll get a different efferent response. So like uh, you'll, you'll end up with a different kind of motor output, like motor changes are going to be the first indication that fatigue is present in the system. And then you see those other things start popping up, like power is usually cited as the next thing. And then, uh, slow speed strength. And these things just drop off in, in that manner. But let's say that, um, you've, been doing a, like let's say a sport motion has just been for whatever reason it probably is fatigue ultimately that that starts the whole process off mm -hmm. and um and then this person does this sport motion differently and let's say they even have success because that can kind of happen sometimes you alter the motion under fatigue you still experience success maybe you win the game and you get a reward from it well now unfortunately dopamine's kind of entered the picture and you will, are more likely to continue to do behaviors that get a dopamine response. Mm -hmm. I mean, plain and simple. So it could be on an unconscious level that you continue to go with the same new motor like engram because that thing worked and it got a response and it's been um, sort of amplified from that process. Now, I don't know if that's correct or not. That's sort of what comes to my mind with this. Mm -hmm. um, but at a certain point, I think it's fair to say that you can start seeing athletes on film demonstrating technical errors that, that are different. Like, you know, let's take a look at this quarterback's throwing motion. We see two years ago when they were completing 67% of their passes that the ball was high and the trajectory of their arm followed this path. You yeah. know, and, and now this year, like this guy's struggling, he's throwing 15 interceptions and he's completing 58% of his passes. And Hey, we look at the trajectory of his arm and it's totally different. And it's like, well, what, what led to that? Was it like, you know, has there been a structural injury or, you know, is, is his O line horrible and he's running around and he's tired and stressed hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. It's just like super tricky to get into that. But I think that, like I was saying, I, I think the, the way I approach it is like, if there's not a problem, I'm not going to make you think about it mm -hmm. until, until there's a problem. Um, and I think that it's just kind of like younger coaches are so excited to show off what they know that they're like, Oh, I just learned this, this whole new, like uh, realm of sensory motor stuff. And I need to have everybody do this stuff so I can impress them and show them how much I know. And it's like, man, just don't screw with this guy. Like, leave him alone. Like, he's doing great. He's happy. Like, I would rather be stupid and successful than very knowledgeable and in my own way. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, ignorance is bliss. Now, the question I have, do when you talk about dopamine and neurotransmitters, uh, the logical next question would be like, well, how do I, can I supplement? How do I change my diet? Do you get a lot of those questions? 
Yeah. Um, and, and like, to me, it's kind of like, I always, I go back to my, my answer I revert to is all roads end at sleep. Um, so, you know, I, I think that oftentimes we just miss the super low hanging fruit with this kind of stuff. And it's like, what's keeping you up at night? You know, I, I ask most people that, uh, that I work with directly on a day to day basis because it's like people want to go and like throw blue blockers on and they want like this, this supplement that's going to help and this, that, and the other thing. And, and most of the time it's kind of like personal relationships or financial situations are the things that bother people more than anything else. And it's, it's kind of like, well, what sorts of behaviors are leading towards those problems in your life? Can we clean those up? And, um, and usually that like, that's going to take a piano off of somebody's back. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 I think I look at those things as being the major things. Like we all do stupid things and that bother us. And, and I, I do them as much as anybody I've, I've screwed up so much and I've kept myself up at night over like, um, personal relationships, like not paying bills on time, being late on deadlines. And those are the things that, that really, haunt me and cause me to have, have stress being present. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like when I hear someone saying that they're, they're fatigued or they're stressed out, it's like, it's almost never the damn training. It's like, what's the shit you don't want to talk about? Like, what do you not want to kind of admit to with your life? Like we're not, nobody's perfect here. And, and I find that when people actually get a chance to talk about that stuff and I feel like they're in an environment that they can trust somebody and then you can help them and they, they actually clear up those behaviors, man, like so many things start working out better for that person. Yeah. Well, I mean, it all sounds like you're, you're coming up with a system here. Uh, um, and, and I don't want to call it like dope, dopamine regulated training, but I think it would be very interesting for you to come up with almost a book or a manual based around some of your findings, you know, yeah. put it out there and let people, you know, kind of work, work, work with it and see what kind of results they get, because it's, it's not conventional for sure, but there's mm. a lot of, there's a lot of good anecdotal information and science behind what you're saying that makes sense to me. Yeah. You I know. mean, I, I, my, I've got an uncle who's a psychiatrist and I was able to talk to him at Thanksgiving about some of this stuff. And, um, you know, it's just a great conversation. And, and, and he was just kind of, he was saying he has success uh, talking about a lot of the same things I do. Where it's like, you know, people have these problems because a lot of it is like this, these competency things. Like we're, we're all unconsciously incompetent about a lot of elements of our lives. And, um, you know, people go to him because of that. They can't figure out why their marriage is failing or, or why, you know, they lost their job or why they're depressed. And it's kind of like, you know, you, 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 <laughs> you listen to this person for two seconds and it's like, well, it's because you're drinking 12 beers a night every night. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and, but they're like completely blind to like, that's what the problem in their marriage is. And it does no good to be like, listen, man, like you, you like you've got to change this behavior. Like this is your problem. You have to like slowly get to the point where they reveal this thing to themselves. Mm -hmm. And then it's like this, this huge response. And, and he was just saying, you know, like, um, he'll sort of bring these things like, Hey, you know, I've just noticed you, you talk a lot about like, you know, your wife is mentioning that like, uh, you know, you, you've, you've, you drink beer every night and, and like your boss has mentioned that, like, what do you make of that? And, um, and then he just, it's the same thing where he's just flipping the script on them. So I, I totally, I think that there's a lot of like interdisciplinary stuff that comes together on that front. And, um, and, and it's like, you know, I'm always working on different projects, but now I've got requests from you and Bill on trying to put this this book together on um, on a lot of these neuro concepts. So I, I guess the the demand might be there for it. Yeah, even if it's just like you put together 150 pages, a little manual, and and walk people through some basic stuff, I think it would be very useful. Um, you yeah. Know. I got a feeling it'd be useful for me too, just so I can actually like systematize my thoughts a little bit more and, and put them down there. Yeah. And some of them may just be illustrations or infographics that kind of make it 
readily apparent to people like, oh, okay, this is my hind brain, this is my forebrain, you know, what is the interaction, like, what should be driving what, right? I, yeah. I, you know, maybe some, and it's just an awareness book, you know, that, that, that's that's guiding people, right? I think that's big, you know, and, and a lot of this, like, really started from, from Charlie Francis reading his stuff way back and just sort of saying, like, sprinting is a hind brain experience, you know, do not bring the forebrain into it. I, and he couldn't have been more correct. You know, yeah. there's a, a million other things you can do that are going that have the potential to be forebrain and helpful and supportive. But when it's time to run, like, I, I don't want you thinking during that. Like, there's a million other drills maybe that we could do that where you can think. But time and place here. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's kind of interesting, like, one of the first things that, that you said to me was like, um, you know, is there middle ground with the brain? And, and it, in many ways I look at like, uh, cause I think that's such a cool question and, and something I've been thinking about lately on this. Cause I'm, I'm trying to present this paradigm of like, uh, two like kind of oppositional halves of a brain here with a dopamine brain and a serotonin norepi brain. Mm hmm. And I think that in the beginning, when I'm teaching people exercise, just pure beginners, I have to mix the two halves together. And by the time I get to advanced people, truly people that have been training a while and they're high level competitors, I need to separate as much as I possibly can. And we're going to do some sessions that are restorative and recovery oriented that are purely sensory based, you know, like yep. feeling the body. Uh, feeling the feet, all of those kinds of things. But when it's time to train, we are just going to absolutely go hog wild and have a party and just kill it. Um, and I look at it the same way as, as kind of what seems to be smart sprint program training of, of sort of like <clears throat> we're, we're going to either do kind of low tempo work or we're going to go at the, at the highest possible level. And the middle ground is sort of where crap lives and we're going to avoid the middle. Yeah. Very polarized approach, right? Um, yeah. And, and then you, uh, one more thing. Um, thanks for, for, thanks for taking the time here, but the, you talked about left versus right brain and the differences mm -hmm. like training one side versus the other. What did you, what have you found there? So that's, that's just another way of sort of splitting the dopamine brain and the serotonin norepi brain. <clears throat> I, I find myself going away from talking left, right, because it's, it just gets people all in a, a huff in a lot of ways. And, and I get it. Like if, if you really look at a brain, both sides of the brain have the potential to do what the other side does. But that doesn't mean that the, each side doesn't start to specialize in certain things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just kind of like the left brain is in our species for the most part, more dominated by dopamine as compared to serotonin and norepinephrine. And it, it sets the left brain up to be your, your language brain language plain and simple is just abstraction. It's more abstract than touching a thing because you're giving a name to a thing and you're able to describe a thing. Uh, the right brain is more dominated by, uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. So it's more of a sensory brain. It doesn't have the same goal setting imperatives as the left brain does. It's just a different, it has a different outlook on the life, on life as compared to the left brain. Mm. The left brain is like looking out at the world and looking at objects and thinking how it can manipulate those objects for progress. The right brain just looks out at the world. It's not trying to necessarily do anything. It's just trying to understand it. It's just trying to appreciate it and be with the world. Um, but it's kind of like, yes, there are differences. Depends on how you're wired. There can be uh, differences with left-handed people and right-handed people and like the, every shade of gray imaginable. But it's from a big picture species stereotype. We're kind of in that direction of, uh, of left and right. And, you know, it's sort of like, it's it's this whole system of like we have a uh, unbalanced vestibular system where uh, you know the auditory component and the vestibular component of the ear are different on the left and the right and the left ear is more vestibular based sending that information to the right brain 
which is more 3D oriented, and the right ear is more auditory based, so it can send things like vibrations that you can pick up to decipher language with to the left brain. Uh, but interestingly enough, when you, when you get into a heart rate variability discussion, the parts of the autonomic system that really talk to the SA node of the heart are driven much more from the right hind brain. Um, so it's like when I think about people that are heading in a bad direction from heart rate variability, I bet their sensory system is starting to get dropped off to a great degree. Hmm. So if I, if I want to improve that, I oftentimes think I have to go to those areas. Um, I just don't want to make them too cognitive and conscious of their sports moves so that I, I don't want to screw up with screw that stuff up with with getting people to be too cerebral with thinking about their sports moves. Wow. Yeah. No, this is fascinating stuff. And yeah, I, you know, I, I'll talk to Bill and we'll, you know, provide some incentives for you to get this book out. <laughs> so because, uh, you know, no, not many people are, you know, let's just say nobody's really talking about this stuff. And I think anything we can do to help get give you a platform or a stage i think would be very very interesting very valuable so yeah i've, I've kind of got my timeline for when i'm going to do this thing like i i'm going to be presenting at, at mike ranfones again in may okay and then i'm going to be going down to costa rica with ben house in june and as soon as i get done with the stuff in June, I'm going to focus my attentions on trying to put that together. Okay, that would be great. And uh, yeah, I got to get you out to Vancouver, um, do something out here too. So we'll talk I'd about be that. More than happy to. Yeah. Yeah, we got to get you on the Pacific Northwest and and, and and get people's brains thinking differently out here. So, but thanks again for your time. Every time I talk to you, Pat, my brain grows a little bit more. So. <laughs> That, that's good. And I don't know if it's the left side or the right side or the forebrain or the hindbrain, but something's <laughs> growing there. Um, well, <laughs> hey, Derek, it's, it's always a pleasure, man. I really uh, can't thank you enough. I, I love these, these times where we get to kind of talk shop and, and really get into this stuff too, because, you know, it's obvious, like, it's amazing to me, like you've, you've got such a incredible career behind you. And yet you're, you're still like, I feel like just as curious as someone just starting off, you know, it's like you always return to a beginner's mind of uh, questioning and curiosity and, and just loving it and enjoying the process. And there's just nowhere near enough of that in our field while also yeah. being just a really great human being. Well, so. that's the thing. Same thing for you uh, is this whole idea that I, you know, I don't, the more that I know, the less that I know kind of thing where you're like, mm -hmm. well, it just, the more knowledge that I get, the more I start to question stuff that I did previously. And so, you know, I, I think that's a good place to be, right? Um, and maybe you and I in a university environment stifles that, right? You know, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's tough. But uh, yeah, I, I hope to see you again soon. Hopefully I'm back in New York in a couple of months, but we'll get together and talk some more. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Pat. Greetings, girl, and welcome to my world of phrasing right now to that is the Daisy 18.